I don't know if you heard about this farmer, right? But there was a farmer who had this pig that he loved. I mean, he proper loved this pig. It was his favourite pig of all the pigs. And he loved it so much. And the farmer didn't have anyone else in his house. And he badly wanted the pig to be like a human. So what he did was he took the pig away from the pig pen. And he scrubbed it with shampoo. He got it nice and clean. Spent ages scrubbing it. Got all the mud off it. Because, you know, pigs, they love to roll around in the mud. And so he scrubs all the mud off. Brings a pig inside. He puts a, a suit on the pig. He gets one tailor-made to fit the pig, yeah? And he puts a cravat on, yeah? I'm not really too sure what a cravat is. Some kind of fancy tie, yeah? And, uh, and then he sits him at the dinner table and he lays out the fork and the spoon and he puts a bowl of food in front of him and he's so happy. And he's like, yeah, now this pig is a human. And he says, Grace. And then he looks up and straight away the pig runs outside dashes through the door, runs into a puddle of mud and starts rolling around in the mud. The pig's a pig. You can't make the pig a human because it's a pig. And what the farmer tried to do is he tried to dress up the pig on the outside to make it like a human. But you can't change something by changing it on the outside, even though many people try I mean, I think that in Britain, many of us, we try to fix up on the outside, especially when we come to church. It might be that we spent longer getting ready today than we did any other day of the week, maybe. You know, we, we make an effort to look good on the outside because we're coming to church, because we're going to be, be before God. Same way... Many people say to me, Duncan, I'll come to church once I get my life back on track. Then I'll come back to church. And then what they do is they try to do loads of stuff to the external. They try to make themselves better on the outside, thinking that then they can come to church and they'll be okay. Well, I've got good news for you. This place is a place for pigs to come to. Pigs who like rolling around in the mud people who like sin, people who know that they like sin and that they keep on sinning. And this is the place to come. And instead of the farmer coming and dressing up us on the outside, God does something very different to our inside. And that's what we're going to read about now as we carry on through John's gospel. But first, let me pray. Lord God, as we look at your word, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit I pray that you would give us understanding and I pray that you would change us, God. Change us on the inside for your glory. Amen. Amen. So if you remember last week, Jesus did something pretty serious. What was it? He had a guard the, uh, the, the uh, synagogue for treating him like, like a shopping centre. Yeah, they, they turned God's house into a shopping centre. And we saw how sometimes we can turn the church into something that it isn't. And we forget that it's all about Jesus. And after Jesus has been in the temple doing all this, we then come to John chapter 2, verse 23, and it says, Now while he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover feast... Many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. That's a good thing, right? He's doing all these miracles, yeah? Jesus is, it doesn't tell us what the miracles are here, but we've seen them in other Bible stories. What are some of the miracles Jesus would do? Raise the dead. Raise the dead, Lazarus. Feeding, feeding the 5,000. Curing leprosy. Curing leprosy. Turning, water wine. Turning water into wine. People are seeing all this stuff and they're like, wow. And it says that they believed in his name. We've looked at this phrase before about believing in his name. That your name in ancient times 
stood for everything you were about. And these people were like, yes, everything that Jesus is about, we like. Jesus has come as the saviour. We like that. Jesus has come as Lord. We like that. He's come as king. We like that. He's come as miracle worker. We like that. Now, is there anything bad so far? There's nothing, nothing bad about that. It's, this is good. This is good. They see Jesus and they're like, yeah, we like that. We like Jesus. Sounds good. Maybe at the moment this is reminding you of some of your friends when you chat to them and you're chatting to them about Jesus and they're like, that sounds good. That sounds really good. I think I'll come to church. Sounds good. Look at verse 30, sorry, verse 24. John chapter 2, verse 24. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men. What does it say Jesus wouldn't do to them? He wouldn't entrust himself to them. So they're like thinking, yeah, we like this Jesus. We would like to be associated with this Jesus. And Jesus is saying, uh-uh, it's not coming back the other way. I'm not going to entrust myself to these guys. I'm not going to enter into a relationship with these guys. And what's the reason? What's the reason according to verse 24? Mm-hmm. How many men did he know? And how many women did he know? Yeah, so when it says men, it means all, all humans, right? Okay. So he's saying he knows all humans. He knows humans. So because he knows humans, he's like, nah, I'm not going to entrust myself to them. They're humans. It's a scary thought. Because we think humans are good, right? Um, when I was on the plane going to America the other week, I saw a film where these aliens are attacking. And it's the same as all the other alien films, isn't it? It's like the general message that Hollywood gives you is, humans are good. Don't kill the poor humans. And the aliens are like, no, we've watched you for years. You're bad. It's time to wipe you out. And the humans are like, no, we're good, honest. Give us another chance. We're, we're brought up to think humans are the good side. We're the good team and everyone else is the bad team. Just like, right, like you grow up, England is the good team and Germany is the bad team. You know, and you, when Germany comes on for the World Cup, you just feel it within you like these are the bad guys. Even though they're probably filled with wonderful people, but you're brought up to think World Cup, England, Germany. Germany are the bad guys. In the same way, we think humans are the good guys. But what it says here is, verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself for them, to them, for he knew all humans. He knew what humans were like. This is a bit like if you'd been around that farmer's house and he says, look, I want you to meet one of my friends. Come in, piggy. And he brings his pig in that he's washed all the mud off and put a suit on. And he says, he says, I'd like you to meet this pig. In fact, this guy can be your friend. Well, you would straight away say, but he's a pig. He's a pig and I'm a human. I'm not going to become best mates with, with a pig. <laughs> By the way, I've never watched a Phil Babe, so I don't know. Someone may be thinking, oh, actually, I've seen it happen. But I've never seen that film, so it's not on my radar. But so... You'd be like, it's a pig. I can't be best friends with a pig. And here Jesus is thinking, these guys are humans. I'm not going to entrust myself to them, even though they believe in my name. Because I know what's really going on with humans. And it says in verse 25, He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. What does it say he knew? What was in a man. In other words, Jesus knows what is inside a human being. There's something inside a human being that Jesus looks at and says, that's bad. And because of that, I'm not going to entrust myself to you because you've got something in you 
That is bad. Now, I want this to just sink down into our souls for a minute, because it can be very good to know that you've got something bad in you. I don't know if any of you have ever had the misfortune to find out from a doctor that you've got something in you that you didn't know you had. And it's a shock, and it feels disgusting. There's something inside you that shouldn't be there, and it's bad. We should have that same shock about this verse. There is something in us that is bad that Jesus looks at and says, because of that, I won't entrust myself to you. But John's gospel doesn't end there, right? If it ended there at verse 25, we'd just be like, okay, well, let's give up now. We might as well give up because we've got something bad in us and Jesus isn't going to entrust himself to us. So let's read on. We're now going to have an example of one of these people who believes in Jesus' name, but Jesus doesn't entrust himself to them because he knows what's inside them. So John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees called Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Okay, so this guy, Nicodemus, he is one of the top religious guys of the day. Okay, he, he's, the top, he's in the top 72, like if you, had, if you had a chart system going on, okay? So if they had Sky News back then, when there is an earthquake or anything like that, it would be guys like Nicodemus, they go to an interview and say, Nicodemus, what's happening? And Nicodemus would say, well, I can tell you what's happened. Look at Jeremiah. And he would give his scholarly opinion of what's going on. He's one of the top religious experts. He's one of the top teachers of God's word. And he comes to Jesus, verse 2. He came to Jesus. When did he come to him? At night. Okay, now, I don't know why he came to him at night. Some people say maybe he was scared. Other people say he was a busy guy. <laughs> he had to come at night. What I do know is that in John's gospel, John often likes to talk about light and dark and a lot of other words that we come across in the next year. It would seem the way that John uses words, because he often likes to give words a double meaning as well, it would seem that when it says he's come at night, that John's kind of letting you know Nicodemus is not in the light camp. <laughs> he's in the dark camp. And we've seen in John chapter 1 about the darkness. And Jesus comes and gives the light to men. So now we're going to see what happens. So Nicodemus so far, he's in the dark, even though he's one of the religious people. He's one of them good people who, he's one of them good people who, if you saw go to church, you'd be like, yeah, he's the kind of guy who should go to church. He's a good guy. He doesn't need to fix up on the outside. He's a good guy. Verse 2, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. So he starts off saying, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. So this sounds like a good thing. He's like, Jesus, you're a, you're a teacher, and you must have come from God because you're doing miracles. Now, who's analysing who here? Nicodemus is analysing Jesus, right? As this religious expert, he's saying, Jesus, we know, we've decided and we agreed, you are from God. Which is kind of a cheeky thing to do if someone comes to you from God to start. In a way, you're acting like you're the authority over them and saying, I, I've checked you out and this is what I know. But it's still kind of a good thing what he's saying. He's saying, you must come from God. You're doing these miracles. Verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now Jesus straight away comes back to Nicodemus and says, Mate, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. 
You might think you see something, you're seeing miraculous signs go on, but you can't really see God's kingdom unless you are born again. In other words, he's implying that Nicodemus is one, not born again, and two, that he can't really see God's kingdom, even though Nicodemus thinks he can. Now, if you were Nicodemus, what would you say next? Yeah, what's born again mean? Yeah, what's born again mean? So, verse 4. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Good question. He's saying, what do you mean, be born again? I've already been born once as a human. How can I possibly be born again? I can't become an embryo again and be born. He doesn't understand what Jesus means. And this is helpful because today many people don't understand what born again means. So BBC News will use the term born again. And they don't know what it means. They just mean... Let's let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says about it. There's lots of confusion about what being born again is. So let's see what the Bible says. Verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. So here he's saying you can't, he's not just saying see the kingdom, now he's actually saying you can't enter God's kingdom. You can't enter God's kingdom unless you're born of water and the Spirit. Now, the kingdom was something that the Jews were waiting for because the Old Testament prophets had told them that God is going to come back one day, bring his kingdom in force, and all of God's enemies are going to be destroyed, and God's people will live with God in God's place under God's rule forever. So they're waiting for this time, and Nicodemus would have been waiting for this time, and it would be good for us in Roehampton to wait for this time because we know life is hard. And it's wonderful to know that there's a promise that one day the king is coming back. He's going to get rid of all of his enemies, all the badness, and we can live with him for all eternity. But Jesus says you can't enter that kingdom. You can't enter that kingdom unless you're born of water and the spirit. Now, if you were Nicodemus, what would you say now? Yeah, again, you'd be like, what do you mean? What do you mean, born of water and the Spirit? Although, Nicodemus shouldn't have asked that. Why? Okay, anyone who's heard me teach this before, pretend you're Nicodemus. Who is Nicodemus? He's an expert. He's an expert. He is an expert in the Bible. He's an expert in the Bible, but look what he says. He says, sorry, He doesn't get it. Jesus goes on to say, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, when he says flesh gives birth to flesh, you all know this, right? When humans give birth, what comes out? A human. (laughs) A human, normally. (laughs) Okay. So normally a human comes out, right? Humans give birth to humans, who give birth to humans, who give birth to humans. Now, bearing in mind what we saw earlier in John chapter 2, this is bad news, because there's something inside humans that Jesus doesn't like, (coughs) something really bad. And Jesus says here, flesh gives birth to flesh. So one bad human gives birth to another bad human, who gives birth to another bad human, and all of these guys have got something bad within them, that Jesus doesn't like. And he's saying this to Nicodemus, because Nicodemus, in his day, many, many, many of the Jews thought that just being born a Jew meant you was in God's kingdom. And they thought, well, if if my parents are Jews and I'm born, then I'm okay. Same thing happens today when people say, because they're British, they're Christian. People still say that. They say, yeah, I'm British, isn't it? I'm a Christian. And they tick the Christian box on the census. 
They think because they're born into a British family, they're Christian. Same thing happens when people think because their parents are Christian, they think that they're okay. But it says here, flesh gives birth to flesh. That's no good. And then Jesus says, but the spirit gives birth to what? Spirit. Spirit. So spirit gives birth to spirit. So Jesus is saying there's an alternative. There's an alternative to just being born of the flesh. The spirit can cause new spiritual life. Spirit gives birth to the spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit can cause you to have spiritual life. Verse 7. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. He's saying this to Nicodemus. He's saying, Nicodemus, you shouldn't be surprised at me saying you must be born again. You're an expert in the Old Testament. You're an expert in God's word. You should know that you've got to be born again. And then, let me just jump down so you can see it here. Verse 10. (coughs) Jesus says to Nicodemus, You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? So here Jesus is saying, You should know this. You know the Old Testament, so you should understand what I mean when I say spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should know what I mean when I say the flesh gives birth to the flesh and the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should know what I mean when I say unless anyone's born of water and the spirit. And you should know because it's written where? In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. You guys are right, but... Let's not go there yet. Let's just say it's written in the Old Testament. Reason why I say that, right, is because all the confusion about what it means to be born again, all the confusion happens when people don't go to the Old Testament. Okay? So let me tell you one theory that people say. Okay? And let me ask you if it says this in the Old Testament. Some people think that being born of water, see here, verse 5, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Some people think that being born of water means when you're born as a baby and your mother's water breaks and they say, well, there you go, that's being born of water. You have to be first born as a human, like Jesus would have to point that out. You must first be born a human. Um, And... and (laughs) And then the second time, you need to be born of the Spirit. Now tell me something. Does it teach that in the Old Testament? Does it say, you must be born a human, step one? It doesn't say that. Anywhere in the Old Testament, does it describe being born as a human as being born of water? No. In fact, even in ancient literature, they didn't talk about it that way. And guess what? We don't, in modern literature, talk about it that way either. They don't say, well, I was born of water. Um, the doctors don't say they were born of water at 8.55 p.m. You know, no, no one does that, okay? So that's an example of where people don't understand what being born again is because they don't go to the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you should know this, it's in the Old Testament. Okay, another common misconception. Some people think that when it says being born of water, that that means you've got to be baptised first, And after you're baptised, then you have to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Old Testament. Does it teach that in the Old Testament? It doesn't teach that in the Old Testament. That's not something that Nicodemus should have known. We also know in the Bible that there's people who saw the kingdom of God and entered the kingdom of God who were never baptised. Can anyone give me someone's name? uh, Enoch. Okay, okay. Let's talk. And what about New Testament? Can you give me a New Testament guy? You're never baptized. The thief on the cross. He was never baptized. So if being born of water means being baptized, then that bloke had a nasty shocking surprise, whatever, shocking store. Because Jesus said, You'll be with me in paradise. So Jesus is saying, You're entering the kingdom. Uh, but he wasn't born of water, if that means. Baptism. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the Old Testament and we're going to see where 
in the context of the kingdom of God coming in the future and God's people living with God, where does it talk about water and spirit? Where does it talk about these two things? So you guys have been shouting it out for time, so come on then. Where is it? Ezekiel 36, okay? So in the Old Testament, right, you've got all these Old Testament books going through, and then you get to the prophets, and here is Ezekiel. If you found Psalms, it's after Psalms. If you found Isaiah, it's after Isaiah. If you get to Daniel, then you've gone too far. So we're going to go there now. Ezekiel 36. We're going to look at Ezekiel 36, verse 24. So this is talking about the kingdom coming, right? So, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. So this is the promise of the kingdom coming, when God's people are going to be brought to live in God's place. And we know from last week that it's not the temple anymore. It's Jesus. Jesus Jesus is the new temple now. And all of us who are in Christ... We're God's place. And it says in verse 25, I will sprinkle clean what? Water. Water. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Hey, this is good news, right? Because we found out earlier that humans have got something bad in them. And we know that we like to clean up on the outside so that we look okay for church. And what we find out here is God gave a promise saying, I'll sprinkle you with water and I will clean you of all your impurities and of your idols, all the things that you put before God. I'll clean you of that. That's amazing. Then it says, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit Put a new spirit in you. Okay, so there we go. If we have one of them things on the guest quiz show, it and now go whoop, whoop, whoop. We've just seen water and we've seen spirit together in the context of God's kingdom. This is what was promised. This is what, I'm going to call him Nebuchadnezzar. What's his name? Nicodemus. This is what Nicodemus should have known, right? So look at this. It actually says, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And we know from John chapter 2 that Jesus looks at humans and says, they got something bad in them. I'm not going to get in a relationship with them. And then we got this wonderful promise where God says, I'll give them a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in them. I'm going to renovate them. I'm going to do them up. I look at them and see them as shabby, evil humans. And I understand why in the movies the aliens want to wipe them out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to... By the way, I don't believe in aliens. Um... (laughs) I saw a few heads look up there. Anyone who's drifted off there is like, what? What did you say? And God's like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them new hearts. I'm going to change them on the inside. He says, second part of verse 26, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. And be careful to keep my laws. Do you see that? He's saying, I'm going to move you so that now you want to live my way. Because God's people never done that before. They were always disobeying him. He looks at humans, he's like, yeah, humans never want to do what I say. I'm going to change their hearts and move them to follow what I say. And then he says, um, verse 27, and I will put my spirit Okay, I will put my spirit in you. Did I just read this one? (laughs) Okay, so there you go. Verse 28. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. This is God living with his people. This is the kingdom. God's people in God's place under God's rule. And for it to happen, God's going to give them water and he's going to give them what? Spirit. I'm going to keep doing that until you guys are like, spirit. Okay, so this is the big promise. This is one of the biggest promises in the Bible. Okay, And Nicodemus, he would have known this promise. He would have known it was coming. And when Jesus said, you can't enter the kingdom, you can't live with God 
unless you are born of water and the Spirit. As a Bible expert, he should have gone, seen Ezekiel. And he wouldn't have said the chapter number because they didn't have them back then. But he would have been like, ah, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And he would have been like, I know what this is about. Right. Having taken all that time to explain that, let me show you why this is so important and why I'm not happy for you to leave the room today thinking that being born of the water and the spirit means something else. This is why. I want you guys to look at this. If you can see the screen, great. If you can't, then look in your Bibles. You're going to do some counting. What I want you to do is count in these verses how many times does God say, I will do something. How many times does he say, I will do something. So start at verse 24 and go down to verse 28. Someone saying seven? We got eight. Whoa. <laughs> any more? Any advances on eight? Ten. We got ten. Seven. We're going to twenty-eight. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm going to change. Eight. Oh. Eight. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Eight. Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. So let's let's have a look. Right. Verse twenty-four. For I will take you out of the nations. So we've got one there, yeah? So that means taking you out of exile. Now, for us lot, the exile is, isn't necessarily living in another country. It can just be living in darkness, in spiritual darkness. God says, I will take you out of that. Next one, I will gather you. So that's the next one. He says, I will gather you. I'm going to gather you with all of God's people together. That's what we're doing on Sundays, gathering together. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you. That's the third one. He says, I'm going to hose you down, cleanse you. Then he says, I will cleanse you from all your impurities. So he makes it double clear. All your impurities, I'm going to cleanse you of them. Boy, that's good news. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Then he says, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's six. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow you. My decrees, and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be your people. I will be your God. That's eight. Okay, let's get the chocolate bars for everyone. Right? Okay, now, so there's eight things. God says, I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. Now, I want you now, in the same verses, count. How many times does it say that we will do something? How many times are we doing something? And it has to be a doing thing. It has to be an action verb. Yeah, where you're actually doing something. It can't be a... Uh... No. Is there anything we do there? Uh-huh. 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 So it's a bit ambiguous. There might be a few where we could say, maybe we do something there. Now, in those times where we do something, like, let's pick one. See where it says, uh, you to follow my decrees. Do we take the initiative? No, God does. God moves our hearts so that we then do that, okay? Let's pick another one. Uh, you will live in the land. I, uh, do we take the initiative there? Who takes the initiative? God, yeah, because it says in verse 24... I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you and bring you back into your land. So it's God who does it. What we see in Ezekiel is that we don't do nothing, basically. God is the one who takes the initiative. He takes the initiative, we don't. It's amazing. This is amazing, right? Because some of you, if you're human, have had times where you've thought, ah, oh, I've got to clean myself up. I'm not ready to come to church yet. I've got to clean myself up. And what God says here is, actually, I'm the one who grabs people 
cleanses them, gives them a new heart, and I bring them to my place. That's how God works. Now let's go back to John, to what Jesus is saying. Jesus says in verse 5, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. What he's saying here is you can't enter God's kingdom unless you've had Ezekiel 36 happen to you. And he says in verse 7, You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So he's saying here, being born of the water and Spirit is a bit like when the wind comes. Like you can't really see the wind, but you can see the wind's effects. You start seeing stuff rustle. Um... We were shooting a video a few months back, and it was a nightmare trying to film where there's no wind. The reason why, if any of you have ever tried filming a video with your camera, there's no wind. And you get home and you listen to it, and there's all this... You're like, where did that come from? It's because you can't see wind. And that's why, like, when the BBC go out filming, they have like, special machines to read the wind. If you're cheap like me, what you do is you get a piece of grass and you start holding it out and you see, is there any wind here? Because wind sometimes is very subtle. Other times, wind is very strong. Wind pretty much does what it wants. And when it's doing what it wants, you're like, oh, look what it just done. It just knocked over my bamboo plant again. Now, Jesus is saying that being born again is a bit like this. It's a bit like the wind. You can't make it happen. The wind does what it wants, same way the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit wants. And in fact, when you read in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit, you get a few passages where it tells you the Holy Spirit does what he wants. Spiritual gifts. He gives people what he wants. Church membership. Holy Spirit puts the people in the church who he wants. He makes them members. You got the Holy Spirit does what he wants, and the Holy Spirit makes people born again. The Holy Spirit is the one who goes, you are now going to have a new heart. I'll take out your heart of flesh and I'll give you a new heart. It's the Holy Spirit who does this. So you might now be thinking, hang on a minute, why is Jesus saying this to Nicodemus? If I had Nicodemus there, I'd be telling him, fix up, become a better person. But Jesus doesn't say that to him. Instead, do you know what? Jesus doesn't give him a single command. I don't know if you thought about that before. There's not a single command here. There's a verse that a lot of people think is a command, but it ain't. Anyone know which one it is? Yeah, verse 7. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. A lot of people think that's a command. It's not. You look it up in the Greek, it's not a command. Jesus is not saying, be born again. What he's saying is, you must be born again. You must be born again. If you're not born again then you can't come in. It's a bit like if you go to see the bank manager and you say, I want to take money out. And he says, do you have your ID? And you say, no, I've got no, no ID. And he says, you must have your ID to take money out. He's not commanding you. He's not saying, get your ID. He's letting you know, you must have it. If you don't have it, you can't come in. Same way, Jesus is just saying, you must be born again. There's no other way. But he's not commanding Nicodemus to be born again. Reason why I say this, someone asked a very good question last week after the sermon, and they said, Well, how can we get people to be Christians then? And that's a very good question. And that's why this text is so helpful, because here we see we can't make anyone a Christian. God makes people Christians. We can tell people, You must be born again. But we can't make people born again. And that's important because there's still guys. There's still books you can buy and still guys who will teach you how to make someone born again. And I've told you before, you know, I read a manual once that said, you get the person, you put your hand on their shoulder and you say, do you want to make a change now? And then you pull them in a little bit. 
that does something psychologically. I don't know what it does, but it does something. And then they're more likely to say, yes, I do. <laughs> Probably because it's kind of scary. Cause, you know. And then you lead them in a prayer, and then you're like, you're born again, brother. You, know? you can't manipulate someone to be born again. The, the spirit does what it wants. It's up to the spirit. But we can tell people, you must be born again. Well, Jesus goes on to say in verse 11, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. See here he's saying, Nicodemus, you say that you've seen my miracles and you guys know I'm from God, but you're not properly accepting my testimony. You don't fully believe in me. He says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus has actually been talking to Nicodemus on quite a low level. And Jesus is saying, there's even more complicated stuff I could chat to you about, but you ain't even going to get it. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what's the application from this? If God does what he wants... (laughs) Why have we got to bother doing anything? So I find John Piper's illustration the most helpful. John Piper says, I'll probably paraphrase him a bit wrong, but basically, if you're not born again, if you don't love Jesus with your whole heart, if you haven't been given a new heart, if you think, you know what, I don't think I'm born again, I kind of like what Jesus stands for, but I'm not all in. I haven't really turned from my sin and turned to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I haven't said, come into my life and be king. I don't think I'm born again. John Piper says, you can't make yourself born again, but have this attitude. Like a child in a room with flames around them. And they know that they are going to burn to death. And there's a door with a very tall handle and they can't get to the handle. They've been trying, but they can't get to the handle. And what they need to do is just shout out and say, open the door, help me. I can't help myself. Open the door and save me. And John Piper says, that's how we should respond to texts like this if we're not born again. We can't make ourselves born again, but we can say, God, I'm stuck. I'm a human. I've got badness inside me. Please make me born again. I need you to do it. He's saying that's the kind of attitude you can have. And God might be gracious and give you a new heart. If you are born again, one of the applications today is to think back to chapter 2, where it says in verse 24, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. If you are born again today, ask yourself this question. Why isn't that you? Why aren't you, verse 24? Why aren't you one of the people who God said, no, I'm not going to be friends with you, because I know what's inside you and it's bad, and I've seen it from day one and it's bad, and I'm not going to be your friend because you're bad. Why are you not verse 24? The only answer is God is gracious and merciful. And he saved us and he said, I'm going to make you born again. I could have left you at verse 24 and verse 25. You could be the person who comes to church and says, yeah, I like Jesus. He seems like a good guy, but never really has their heart changed. And instead, I changed your heart because I'm a merciful God. And that's something that should really seriously change the way we live our lives. Where we're not proud, but where we're thankful. We're the most grateful people on the planet because we know that God didn't leave us at verse 24. He didn't let us be like those guys who are in hell. Instead, he said, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to give you a new heart. He is a wonderful, merciful God. The last application is, if you've got friends who you just don't think are ever going to get saved, keep praying for them. Don't write them off. Ask God to save them. Ask God that he would make them born again. 
and keep sharing the gospel with them because God is the one who does it. He can save anyone. We don't want to write people off and say, no, he wouldn't save that guy, he's too bad. And when we do that, we're implying that we were good people who God saved. And we're not, we're all sinners who should be in verse 24, but because of God's mercy and grace, we're not. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you. You are our saviour and our king. And you have saved us. You have given us new life. You put a new spirit within us and a new heart. And we didn't deserve this. So we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. And we pray that you'd help us to be thankful, grateful people. And we pray, please, God, that you'd help us to share the gospel with other people and that you would save other people as we give them the gospel. We pray that you'd save more people in Roehampton, cause more people to be born again in Roehampton. For your glory. Amen.